book of Nahum. Nahum chapter 1, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 15 here this morning, or this evening. Now, this particular book of Nahum, notice it is described that way in verse 1, the burden against Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum. So the vision and the prophecies that are given by Nahum were considered all together as a book. And so that's why we call these books of the Bible. Now, Jonah was sent to the city of Nineveh in somewhere between 785 and 753 B.C. And he told the people there that they were going to perish. He didn't ask them to repent. He just told them they were going to perish, which is very interesting because Jonah really didn't like the people of Nineveh. He wanted to see them judged. And so God had to deal with the prophet Jonah because of his uh, attitude. And so he needed a little attitude adjustment. But Nineveh repented, and God spared them of the judgment that Jonah proclaimed. But not soon after that, Nineveh returned to their same wickedness. And they continued on in their wickedness and even became greater in their wickedness. So history reveals that fact very clearly. And so about a hundred years later, later, God sends Nahum to proclaim these words of prophecy uh, concerning the city of Nineveh. Now Nahum prophesied about 663 to 654 B.C. And he prophesied of the ultimate destruction of the city of Nineveh and of the Assyrian Empire. The Babylonians and the Medes and the Scythians came together and they destroyed the entire kingdom of the Assyrians. Now this message is basically to the people of Judah, which was to comfort them that they would be set free from the oppression of the Assyrians. Now you remember history tells us that the Assyrians came and they took the ten northern tribes. They came further down. Uh, Shennacherib was the king at that time. And he came all the way to the city of Jerusalem. And Hezekiah prayed, sought the Lord, and God delivered the city of Jerusalem. And Shennacherib went back to his the city of Nineveh, he was there actually assassinated by his own children uh, who fled and uh, another king took over for him. So this was a, a message of comfort to those in Judah that they would not have to fear the Assyrians anymore. So let's just begin. Verse 1, chapter 1. The burden against Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkoshite. God is jealous, and the Lord avenges. The Lord avenges and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserves wrath for his enemies. Now, it's interesting here that Nahum begins with wrath. He begins with justice. Now, many times I think that when people read the passages that deal with judgment or justice, many times Christians recoil at that. They just kind of go, oh, wait a minute, I thought God was a God of love. Well, God is a God of love. But Jesus said very similar things in the New Testament. So, you have to remember and you have to balance, you know, they, many times people think that, you know, the Old Testament God is a God of justice and a God of wrath, and the New Testament God, he's a, he's a nice guy. He's a God of love. Jesus is meek and mild, but it says in the book of Revelation that he is going to come with his wrath in chapter 6 of Revelation, 
And it says that he will come and judge and make war against this world in Revelation 19. So Jesus came in mercy with forgiveness in seeking reconciliation with this world. But one day he's going to come in wrath. Now, to balance this, you have to understand what real love is. Real love is a perfect balance of justice and mercy. And God is going to demonstrate and declare his mercy in this chapter too. You'll see that. It'll, it, it's clearly taught here. But it is for those that will respond to him and receive him. Those that will trust him and follow him. But justice is reserved for his enemies. Okay? So unless someone who is his enemy, which you were once his enemy, you have turned from your sin to follow him. And so he declares here, God is jealous. Now many times when people look at that, they say, wait a minute, God is jealous? I thought jealousy was sinful and wrong. Well, there is a godly jealousy and there is a sinful jealousy just like there is a godly anger and there is a sinful anger and you can see this very clearly in the scripture godly jealousy notice in the new testament second corinthians 11 2 and 3 paul said this for i am jealous for you with godly jealousy for I have betrothed you to one husband. Now he's speaking about the church in Corinth. He says, I have betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. So Paul was concerned with a godly jealousy over the church of Corinth. Now the word here jealous in the Greek means to set one's heart on someone with a deep desire for an exclusive relationship. So when a person comes to Christ, they have that personal relationship with him, that one-on-one -on -one love relationship with him. That is what the Lord wants to continue. And the Lord is saying here, you guys in Nineveh, the Assyrians, you have messed with my people. And so I'm coming as a jealous God. And I am coming against you in wrath. One of the best examples of a godly anger is given to us again in the New Testament, Ephesians 4.26. It says there, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. So notice he speaks about both forms, godly and ungodly anger in that one verse. So he commands you to be angry, but not sin. And then he says, do not let the sun go down on your wrath. So there is a godly anger that we need and there is an ungodly anger that we want to avoid. And you have to learn what is the difference. Now, if you want to keep that one-on-one -on -one relationship with him, how do you do that? We love the Lord with all your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength. It says in Matthew 22, 37, Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. So God wants an exclusive relationship with you. He doesn't want you loving another. He wants to be first in your life. If you have a spouse, you want an exclusive relationship with your spouse. Do you not? Anything other than that would be adulterous. And that is the same principle that is described here. And so if you love him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, you're going to keep that exclusive relationship, keeping him first. 
When you do that, you will be satisfied. You will find what God intends for your life, what he has promised for your life. Unless you have that exclusive love relationship with him, you will never be happy. You will never find the satisfaction that you want. You will never see the purposes of God fulfilled in your life. It won't happen. You need to have that one-on-one -on -one love relationship with him. So God is declaring here his holiness and that he reserves wrath for his enemies. That God is the one that avenges. Notice the word jealous in verse 2. The Lord avenges in verse 2. The Lord takes vengeance. Now the word vengeance literally means to mete out justice. That's simply all it means. It means I have patiently waited. I have sought. I have pursued but they have made their decision, and so now I will mete out justice. There is a time for mercy, and there is a time for justice. And that time for mercy, we are in the midst of right now. There is going to be judgment coming. It's coming just as sure as we are sitting here. It's going to happen in our country, and it will happen with our world. Now, God is the only one who avenges evil. You are not to avenge yourself, not to take vengeance. It says in Romans 12, 17 through 19, he says, Re Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, and note that word if, if it is possible, because sometimes it's not, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but give place, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So he says, I am the one that meets out justice. I'm the one that takes care of that. So don't try and avenge yourself or render evil for evil. That's not what he intends. Now notice verse 3. We've seen justice. Notice, the Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord has his way in the whirlwind and in the storm. And the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry and dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither and the flower of Lebanon wilts. The mountains quake before him. The hills melt. The earth heaves at his presence. Yes, the world and all who dwell in it. Who can stand before his indignation? And who can endure the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. Incredible here. Notice he says in verse 3, first, the beginning of verse 3, the Lord is slow to anger and great in power. So how slow is God to anger? Oh, incredibly slow. Just with the city of Nineveh, he has waited several hundred years in seeking their repentance. Just a hundred years since Jonah came to them. They had a long history before that. So at, at the minimum, a hundred years. After Nahum gives this prophecy, about 50 years later, judgment came. And the Babylonians, the Medes, and the Scythians came against them, and they wiped the Assyrian Empire from the earth. We'll talk more about that destruction in just a minute. But notice how patient God is. Why is he so patient? Well, it's simply because he desires to show mercy. That's why. That's why he sent Jonah to them a hundred years before, because he cared about them. 
Jonah didn't care about these people, but God did. And so he sent a prophet to them. I don't believe Nahum actually went to Nineveh. He is giving these prophecies just to the people of Judah. You can see that from several passages that we will go over in this, this book of prophecy. Because he's speaking more to the people of God than he is to the Ninevites. They have already had their opportunity. And so God gave them a space to repent. They repented and then they went right back to their old ways again. And so God has been extremely patient with them. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Who does he want to come to repentance? All. That is his desire. And so the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. His promise to forgive, he is not slack with. And his promise to judge, he is not slack concerning either. So I mean, in both directions, God is not, he has promised. He has promised to show mercy. He has promised to judge when there is an unrepentant heart. Now, even though he is slow to anger, notice this last little part of uh, the first part of verse 3, but will not at all acquit the wicked. The word acquit is a Hebrew word that literally means to leave unpunished or to let wickedness pass. So he's saying here, even though I am slow to anger and I've got mercy and I want to forgive, I am not going to let this wickedness slide. I'm not going to do it. If there is no repentance, then I will judge. And that is what I have seen him do in individual people's lives as well. God is extremely patient. But I'll tell you, there is a point and a time when he says, enough. And then he begins to chastise. He begins to correct. He begins to deal in that person's life. And if they fail to respond to that chastening, ultimately judgment will come because he is a faithful God. He keeps his promises. In Numbers chapter 14, verse 18, it says there, the Lord is long-suffering and abundant in mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression. But, here's the divine contrast, but he, is in, he by no means clears the guilty. He doesn't just pass by guilt. There has to be repentance if he is going to clear somebody of their guilt. So he doesn't clear the guilty. He visits the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. Now you say, well, that isn't fair. Why would he judge people to the third and fourth generation? Well, there's one little phrase that's missing in this verse, but it is in other verses. It says, of them that hate me. So he will visit iniquity on the third and fourth generation of those who continue to hate him. So if my children hate the Lord like I hate him, and my grandchildren hate the Lord like I hate him, then they're going to experience the same judgment that I would experience if I were in that circumstance. So it's, this is a serious thing. If you want to read that little phrase, it's in, judge, excuse me, in Exodus 25, verse 5. Exodus 20, verse 5. And it adds that little place. This particular passage is given four times. The first time of them that hate me is present in the text. The next two times it is not. And the last time it is quoted, it, is, it has that little phrase, of them that hate me. And so the Lord is slow to anger, merciful, long-suffering, abundant in mercy. 
I have found that he is abundant in mercy toward me. I think you have found he is abundant in mercy toward you. Rejoice in that. Now, the latter part of verse 3, he goes on here to describe his sovereignty. God dis- declares his sovereignty in judgment. And he declares here, the Lord has his way. Now that declares a sovereign God. He has his way. He always has his way. He will always accomplish his purposes, whether I am involved in those purposes or not. Whether I go along with what he's doing or not, he is going to us fulfill his way. And he does that through his judgment. Now notice he describes here a list of natural disasters. At the end of verse 3, he says, in the whirlwind and the storm. And then he says in verse 4, he rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all all the rivers. Uh, Verse 5, the mountains quake, there's an earthquake, and the earth heaves at his presence. And basically he says, who can stand before his indignation? See, when the Lord brings judgment and when he chooses to use a natural disaster to judge, there isn't anybody that is going to withstand him. This particular scene is declared also in the book of Revelation in chapter 6, verse 17, when the question is made there, for, great, for the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Whose wrath is he talking about here? He's talking about the wrath of the Lamb, the wrath of Jesus Christ. And so he declares here very simply, that day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand? See, nobody is going to be able to stand during the tribulation period. That is not going to be a fun time. Now the Lord uses natural disasters. He uses tornadoes and storms and droughts and earthquakes. All of what is described here. Many places in the Old Testament you see these this used I'll give you a couple of examples when the children of Israel left Egypt what took place incredible works supernatural works occurred in their deliverance and the sea was dried up and parted for them so that they might walk through on dry ground that's pretty powerful And then what happened when the Egyptians tried to follow them into the sea? They were all drowned. So God can use natural disasters like that very simply. Another one is found in the book of Judges, chapters uh, 5 and 6. You can read that story there concerning uh, Sisera, the commander of the army of the Jabin, the king of Canaan. He was the king who reigned in the city of Hazor, which is just north of the Sea of Galilee. It's it's an incredible place. I've been there. It is, you can still see the the tell uh, that is present there. I mean, it's this raised mound of, of ground. Every time we go, we go right by Hazor, and you think to yourself, well, Jabin used to be here. He used to reside on that hill and Sisera and his 900 chariots they they abused and oppressed the nation Israel for many years and God came and spoke to Deborah the prophetess and said go tell Barak that he is to take 10,000 men and go against Sisera and Barak said Well, if you go with me, Deborah, I will go. And she said, I'll go with you, but there will be no glory in the victory for you because the Lord will deliver the armies of Sisera into the hand of a woman. (laughs) What a slap in the face, I'm telling you. And he goes, but would you come? 
Anyway, so she went. And God did just what he said he would do. How did he do that? Well, in Judges chapter 5, verse 4, notice it declares there, they said, Lord, when you went out from Sur, when you marched from the field of Edom, the earth trembled and the heavens poured, the clouds also poured water. And so God rained on the armies of Sisera. Their chariots were worthless in the mud. And then in Judges 5.21, it says the torrent of Kishon swept them away. The ancient torrent, the torrent of Kishon. O oh, my soul, march on in strength. And so if, when you stand on the top of Mount Carmel, you look down and you can see the little river of Kishon right below it. It's still flowing today. And that river overflowed and literally swept his army away. So God can do mighty things. Now, after the city of Nineveh was destroyed, it was completely obliterated from the earth. Nobody even knew where the city of Nineveh was. It was only in 1845 that an archaeologist, A.H. Laird, found one part of the wall and began to dig. And they found this city because it literally, the mount, the earth shook. It says, the earth heaves at his presence. Who can endure the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire. They burn the city to the ground. And it says the rocks are thrown down by him. And so literally this place was obliterated. It was just a heap on the ground. I'll show you a picture in just a moment. Then notice verse 7. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. And he knows those who trust in him. So here, God inserts this to remind them of his mercy, of his goodness. Isn't it interesting? In the midst of all this judgment and wrath, the Lord says in verse 3, I'm slow to anger, incredibly merciful. And then he declares here, I am good, and I'm a stronghold. A refuge, literally, is the Hebrew word. A refuge in the day of trouble. So the Ninevites thought that Nineveh was their stronghold. God threw it to the ground. And he turns around and he says, but I'm your stronghold. I'm the real stronghold. It's not made of stone and mud bricks. It's, I am a God who is your stronghold in a day of trouble. And he knows those who trust in him. In the New Testament, it says the Lord knows. He knows you. Over and over again, that message is given. The Lord knows. He knows that you trust him and he will work in your behalf because he knows that. And he knows everything about you. And so he declares here his goodness and his knowledge of those who trust him. One of the, I think one of the simplest ways to know how good God is is just his willingness to forgive and to show mercy. His perseverance and his long suffering after people. He strives with them. But the Lord, it says in scripture, will not always strive with man. There's a point at which he stops. So, it's incredibly important for you to remember he has, he has sought you out. He has pursued you. He has made himself known to you. That is why you're a Christian. That's why you're following him. Remember that. That is God's goodness. So when the day of trouble comes, notice, it says he's a stronghold in the day of trouble. 
So does that mean that people who really trust in him don't ever have any trouble? No. I, yeah, I do have trouble. I have trouble just like everybody else in this room. But he has a stronghold, a refuge in the day of trouble. In Psalm 46.1, it says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. You know, who needs help when you're not in trouble? I need help because I'm in trouble all the time. <laughs> I need help, a lot of help, all the time. But he is so willing to forgive and to strengthen you. Jesus said this in Matthew 12, 31. He said, Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men. Wow. Is that goodness? There is, there is no goodness like that goodness. It's beyond our comprehension. His incredible goodness. Paul said in 2 Thessalonians 1, 12, 1, 11, It says there, therefore I... Let's see, where is that? I don't have that written down here, sorry. 2 Thessalonians, let me turn there real quick. Second Thessalonians 1.11, it says, Therefore we also pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. Do you want him to fulfill the good pleasure of his goodness inside of you with a work of faith with power? That's what he wants to do in each of your lives. So is he your refuge? Do you run to him? Or do you run to, to people? Do you run to the bottle? Do you run to drugs or alcohol? I mean, do you run to him? Is he your refuge? I pray that he is. Now notice in verse 8, he declares that he is going to make an end of Nineveh. Verse 8, he says, With an overflowing flood, he will make an utter end of of its place. Darkness will, pur- will pursue his enemies. What will you conspire against the Lord? What do you, what do you conspire against the Lord? He will make an utter end of it. Affliction will not rise a second time. For while tangled like thorns and while drunken like drunkards, this is referring to the men of Nineveh, the soldiers of Nineveh, they shall be devoured like stubble, fully dried, like a fire that just comes in and and just burns the stubble of a hayfield. He says, From you comes forth one who plots evil against the Lord. This was the king of Nineveh, a wicked counselor, he is called. So here he declares that He's going to make an end of this place. After Nineveh was destroyed, it was never rebuilt. It has never been rebuilt to this day. So when God says he's going to make an end of something, he means it. Now, let me just tell you the story of what took place, what's recorded in the historical chronicles called the Babylonian Chronicles. Let me tell you what happened. And then let's go back and read what God said would take place. So the Babylonians, the Medes, and the Scythians all came together. They began to assault the Assyrian Empire. They began to take one city after another until finally they surrounded Nineveh. Now, they began to put a siege upon the city of Nineveh, and they could not break through its walls. I'll show you a picture in just a moment. There was a double wall that they had built that was 100 feet high, and they could not break through the walls. So the king of Assyria said it describes him giving extra provisions to his soldiers, 
and an extra allotment of wine. And they all got drunk. And so there are a bunch of drunken soldiers guarding the walls of Nineveh. And then a great rainstorm came. Now, Nineveh sits on the convergence of two rivers, the Tigris River and the Kos River. And so these two rivers come together. Nineveh sits right next to it. And so the commander of the Babylonian army wrote in his account of the siege that there was a great electric storm, a great thunder and lightning storm like he had never seen. And so the rivers rose, and one of the rivers came and literally took out one of the walls that had passed by. The wall fell, and so the king of Assyria said, all is lost, and he took and he filled the inside of his palace with, all a, with a whole bunch of wood, and he set it on fire, and he burned himself and his entire family and all his servants together in the fire. And the other soldiers that were left on the wall, they opened the city gates, and they invited them in, and the Babylonians showed absolutely no mercy upon them and literally just killed them all and then burned the rest of the city with fire. So notice verse 8. He says, But with an overflowing flood, he will make an utter end of it, of its place. Isn't that interesting? Fifty years before the flood ever occurs, God declares, this is how your, your end will come. And then he said that while drunkards, verse 10, while the drunken like drunkards, they shall be devoured like stubble, fully dried. And so literally they were consumed. So let me show you the picture of Nineveh. So here is, this is the outer wall right here. This is the inner wall. This is the actual wall of Nineveh. Now, if you look down here, this is the rest of the uncovered wall, just this mound of dirt. That's why nobody could ever find it. They didn't know where it was because it looked just like that. So this was uncovered, and so you can see this particular wall and the double wall. And there is one of the rivers right there. It's still flowing right next to the city. And so... This particular city is probably, what we're seeing right there, is probably no longer there because ISIS has come and completely destroyed the, all the artifacts, all of the ruins from Nineveh. They went to the tomb of Jonah and destroyed his, his tomb and leveled it to the ground and destroyed all the artifacts that were still there in the museum. You saw that on television. So this wall is probably not even there today. The rest of it is, it's still, on, it's still covered by the dirt. But that is why they could not find the city. So when God says, I will make an utter end of it, as he says there at the end of verse 9, I will make an utter end of it, he did just that. Notice he declares here, affliction will not rise up a second time. And then down, notice in the end of verse 12, he said, though I have afflicted you, I will afflict you no more. Now, what is that declaring? Well, it's simply declaring that God is, he's speaking to the people of Israel, the, those in Judah, that he will not afflict them again a second time from the Assyrians. Why? because they are going to be no more. Verse 12, he says, Thus says the Lord, though they are safe, and likewise many, yet in this manner they will be cut down. When he passes through, 
Though I have afflicted you, I will afflict you no more. This is the message of comfort to his people. For now I will break off his yoke from you and burst your bonds apart. And so the oppression of the Assyrians would be stopped at the destruction of this empire. Then verse 14, <clears throat> this is a uh, statement to the king of Assyria. He said, the Lord has given a command concerning you, the one that has oppressed the people, that, uh, who's put bonds upon them, I have given a commandment concerning you. Your name shall be perpetuated no longer. In other words, his whole family lineage would be extinguished. He says, your name shall be perpetuated no longer. Out of the house of your gods, I will cut off the carved image and the molten image. I will dig your grave for you are vile. God says, I will dig your grave. Boy, I don't want him to say that to me. <laughs> because if he digs your grave, you're going in it. That is for sure. And then he ends chapter 1 with verse 15. Now this is interesting. Notice he says, Behold the mountains, the feet of him who brings good tidings, who proclaims peace, O Judah, keep your appointed feasts, perform your vows, for the wicked one shall no more pass through you. He is utterly cut off. So why do I believe that these messages and these prophecies were specifically to the people of Judah? Because he says it right here. So I don't believe Nahum actually went to the city of Nineveh like Jonah did. He is proclaiming these to the people of Judah. And he says, Behold on the mountains the feet of him who brings good tidings, who proclaims peace. Now, where have you ever read that verse of Scripture in the New Testament? Well, it's in the book of Romans. Paul there declares this same truth. In fact, turn over with me there to Romans chapter 10. Romans 10 and verse 14. Here Paul is talking about the glad tidings of peace that God has sent to his people. And he says there, how, they, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. Interesting. So Paul here quotes from the book of Nahum. He quotes this particular passage. Now, who is the one bringing glad tidings of peace? I mean, in the text here. In Nahum. Who is, who is that? It's Nahum himself. He is the one bringing glad tidings. A message of comfort. A message of peace to the people of God. That they don't have to fear the Assyrians any longer. They don't have to take their oppression any longer. They are not going to come a second time into the land and assault the kingdom of Judah. Now, why was that? Why, why did God repel them and keep them from the kingdom of Judah? It was because of Hezekiah the king who humbled himself, sought the Lord, and God said, I will take care of it, Hezekiah. Don't worry. And God sent an angel and he killed 185,000 Assyrians that were outside of the city walls of Jerusalem. You know, our missionary, Cheryl Hancock Watts, she f was sifting dirt from an in an archaeological site in Jerusalem. And you know, she found a Babylonian arrowhead, 
I mean, it's one of five arrowheads that they have recovered in the entire world. And she found one of them. And so this, this was an incredible victory. And here Nahum is proclaiming this good tidings of peace. But notice what he says in verse, at the end of verse 15. O Judah, keep your appointed feasts. Perform your vows. In other words, follow the Lord. Follow him. Seek him. Pursue him. Don't, don't go back to your old ways because the king before Hezekiah was an evil king and they, they were into idolatry. And when Hezekiah came on the scene, he brought great revival to the nation. And that is the only reason why they were spared. That's it. So Nahum says, you know what? I've given you the glad tidings, but you need to obey him. You need to pursue him. You need to follow him. Because you're the wicked one or the king of Assyria has been cut off. So, pretty powerful. Let's go to him in prayer. Father, thank you that you are God that is good. You are slow to anger. You are plenteous in mercy, abundant in mercy towards each of us. And Lord, you have and desire to forgive all, to bring all to repentance. And so, Lord, we pray that you would just pour out your spirit upon this nation, our nation. Because, Lord, we know that unless you bring revival to our nation, we are finished. We will go the way of all of the other republics of history. Lord, I pray that you would bring awakening to your people. And I pray especially for each of us here tonight that you would bring that anointing of your spirit upon us, that we would preach the gospel, that we would have beautiful feet, that we would bring glad tidings of peace to people and share the peace that belongs to them if they will simply just turn to you, the Prince of Peace. Lord, we ask you to enable us to do it. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.